Very Much So Productions presents... Uh, what's a review? What's a review? I know! North Korean gymnastics propaganda! Time to bust out my Fabi communist gear and join my comrades! Hi, I'm the Asian film fanatic, and this is my review of the UK documentary A State of Mind. Actuality, real life authenticity, that's what I'm talking about. All that nasty stuff you've been hearing about North Korea is absolute bullcrap! North Korea is a paradise of pure perfection! In 2002, filmmaker Daniel Gordon released a documentary about a North Korean soccer team who played in the 1966 World Cup. It took him four years to gain access to the country and the players involved. This positive relationship allowed him to return and document the mass games in 2003. The mass games are a massive coordinated display of gymnastics and performing arts. These demonstrations emphasize precise group performances over individual expression. They also make for spectacular shows of patriotism and propaganda. North Korea has been doing this since 1946, probably since its adoption of communism. Traditionally, they would be held as highlights for the Arirang festival and national holidays. These celebrations can last several days or months even. The motive can be disturbing, but the mass games is admittedly a very beautiful and awe-inspiring performance. The film was written, directed, produced, and narrated by Daniel Gordon. His filmmaking team consisted of a bare-bones crew of three. Himself, associate producer Nick Bonner, and cinematographer Nick Bennett. The results are rather impressive considering their limited resources. Nick Bonner is also the founder of a private North Korean tourism agency called Choreo Tours. So you can make the argument this movie has a bit of a tainted connection. It's obvious North Korea would only allow a positive production, but that doesn't make it evil, just a little biased. Perceptions from both sides are reported fairly, but obviously, this being a documentary in the DPRK, the partiality leans more towards the North Koreans' perspective. Daniel states there were translators and guides present at all times, but neither sought to interfere nor censor the footage. You'd think this would only focus on the impersonal collective, so it's a little ironic that a state of mind actually focuses on two individual adolescent girls. This was Daniel Gordon's directive. He wanted to turn his attention on the people, asking the state sponsors to introduce him to two outstanding subjects. The first girl is Pak Hun Sun. Her family is from the working class. The other girl is Kim Song Yone. Her family is from the intellectual class. Once you see these subjects open up, start smiling and acting natural, it's easy to find them likable, despite their ideology. When I first saw this in the mid-2000s, it was one of the first documentaries I saw on North Korea. Just getting a mere glimpse into a closed country was interesting. Daniel Gordon's goal was to record these individuals' thoughts, lives, and participation in the mass games. He also wanted to note the historical and political context while being non-judgmental. At its base level, I appreciate documentaries as a window into a real time and place. Sure, the conditions are restricted here, but it's not a fluffy travel show, nor is it pure propaganda. This is a genuinely solid documentary. Something that just shows us plainly what's happening and allowing people to speak for themselves. That's insight enough. Now, I'm going to go over the movie. North Korea is the least visited, known, and understood country in the world. Daniel Gordon introduces the two girls, the mass games, international tensions, and his unparalleled access for the first, first time. time By first, he means, never mind that other North Korean documentary I did one year before this. February 2003, the place is Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. People outdoors play games and have fun, the young and the old. Before a group of abused children, rigorous gymnastics training fills their day. Just kidding about the abused part. The mass games club, as they call it, is not easy. Training on the concrete for hours in the winter cold. 13-year-old Pak Hun Sun has been in the club for four years. 
but through the pain, the thought of performing for the general motivates her. The intent to cultivate submissive group mentality, pleasing their dear leader, General Kim Jong Il. I think it's funny when she first started. Pak Hun Sun admitted to playing hooky. When her mother and teacher found out, they gave her an earful. See, it's little rebellious bits like that that lend honesty and authenticity to this teen's interview. Her mother and grandparents seem friendly. At the victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum, as they call it, her grandfather mentions the U.S. conducted biological warfare on them with infected insects. China also supports this controversial accusation, but the U.S. continues to deny it. He goes on describing how the war's atrocities fuel his absolute hatred of U.S. imperialism. Wait, hold on. Traitor! The parody of your North Korean genetics are corrupted by imperious blue-gray eyes. Air raid drills and blackouts underline the serious fear North Koreans have of a U.S. invasion. Such hassles cultivate American resentment. In their home, propaganda artifacts litter their space, a sign proclaiming them as the general's family, a single-channel state-run TV, dear and great leader portraits, and a propaganda radio you can't turn off. It's nice to see some kitchen and home cooking shots. Gordon makes clear these living conditions are of a privileged elite. We move on to 11-year-old Kim Songyeonae as her mother tries to wake her for school. Yeah, we've all been there. Her father is a physics lecturer. Her mother, a housewife. She has two older sisters and a dog. Once again, I enjoy seeing normal stuff like her mom telling her to eat more. In preparing her daughter's gymnastics clothes, she meets up with Hun Sun, who's like a big sister. She helps Sung Yeonae polish her skills. Hun Sun enjoys going over to the Kim's place. Being the only child, she contrasts back home as lonely and boring, wishing she had siblings. Hun Sun reveals a reason she ran away from practice initially was that the older students would berate her, but she eventually developed to be one of the more skillful ones. But wait, what about Zhang Shen? Yeah, sing for us, Zhang Shen. I want to see more of that girl, the funny girl, the entertainer. Make people laugh. Amuse us, you you clown, you. Song Yeonae's mother talks about the arduous march. A period of food shortages during the 90s. She blames imperialist blockades and abnormal climactic phenomena. Daniel Gordon candidly tells us most of the population still relies on foreign aid. Curiously, English is taught at school. Foreign language is a weapon for the life and struggle. That's reportedly a quote by Karl Marx, but it's supposed to be a foreign language is a weapon in the struggle of life. Some English class, the teacher says Song Yeonae isn't a good student because she doesn't study enough. She's but not bad. Quite good enough. Not very bad. <laughs> How will you spend your next holiday? Well, I go to the swimming pool with my brother. Oh, wonderful! Can you swim? Of course I can. I'm a good swimmer. Should I come with you? Yes, please. Let's go together. Will your sister come too? No, she won't. She leaves that day. Good translation. Next that time. was terrible. Hun Sun has taught Kim Il Sung's three greatnesses: greatness in ideology, greatness in leadership, and greatness in aura. Oh, it's a cult! I think she's talking about Jesus. Following Hun Sun home, we watch her leisure activities, like communist karaoke. Our party is the best. And how can we forget the communist accordion? We also hear some parenting values. 
우리 어머니는 내가 뭘 말하는 건다 뜯어주는데 성무같이 지냅니다 어머니는 Oh that's bad parenting right there She's gonna be messed up On a Sunday, Kim Song Yeon A's family picnics and goes river boating Her dad talks about wanting to know what's going on in Iraq and wishes he had sons He's a quiet intellectual, but his girls are always talking at home her parents pester Song Yeon-ae to do homework, but she wants to watch TV. Coming a squirrel! <coughs> this North Korean cartoon is known as Squirrel and the Hedgehog. Kim Il-sung's birthday is honored, and Song Yeon-ae's family spends the day going to the countryside, visiting her dad's old army buddy. He sends his kids away to the army. Now his life is like a honeymoon! Ha <laughs> ha! Farm life's been difficult. The great leader's death, natural disasters, and U.S. embargoes have been tough. But thanks to government aid and the North Korean principle of Juche, or independent self-reliance, he's pulled through. Juche is about making do with what you have, especially when the government can't help. But how could that be? Communism solves everything! There is no poverty in communism! Their trip to Mount Pekdu seems like a monument toward diversion. The celebration of the founding of the DPRK arrives. The parade participation is massive. Later that day, Hun Sun checks to see if they can spot her mom on TV. Tomorrow, the mass games will begin. Hun Sun nervously hopes the general will be there. In the morning, the big moment arrives and the performance is pretty spectacular. It's so magical. <laughs> Those guys look bored. Yeah, those guys look excited. After its conclusion, the girls go back to training in anticipation for the next mass games. The end. Documentaries feature real people, and there's just something refreshing about watching real life. Even though they present bias and distortions of truth, there's still a higher level of authenticity. Due to the tight control of filming, North Korean documentaries are usually from a tourist point of view, featuring cultural landmarks and guide interactions. Oftentimes, the experience comes out the same. The sights and culture are enjoyed. People are very friendly, but live under very controlled conditions and ideology. They worship their leader, have strong opinions, and they expose high nationalism. Every country indoctrinates, but North Korea takes up to cult level extremes. I also watch a lot of fictional movies. They're the world of make-believe. It's kind of ironic. Not all, but a good amount of South Korean movies I've seen can be tragic, self-critical, perverse, or disturbing freely showing the Korean concept of Han, which means suffering unresolved injustice, causing intense feelings of sorrow, hope, and revenge. With the few North Korean movies I've seen, they're almost like Disney movies, more optimistic, safer, cheerful, idealistic, and fairy tale like Some people might find that idealism off-putting and cut straight to the notorious politics and problems that plague North Korea. But I think it was a good decision to focus more on the goal of capturing glimpses into the lives of these individuals. At its heart, this film is about these two girls in the socialist system. It may be legitimate to critique the politics of the mass games, but to delve into things like human rights issues is inappropriate. It's just an aspirational story about two brainwashed girls training for a show. What's wrong with that? I enjoyed that. I found the state of mind to be quite interesting just to see how North Koreans think and what they value. Their strong one-sided patriotism, nationalism, devotion to their leader and ideology, but also their humanity and social traits. I think Daniel Gordon and his crew did a fine job capturing these two North Korean girls in their lives as participants of the mass games. I like that they allowed the people involved to speak for themselves without passing judgment. There weren't any surprises, revelations, or hidden secrets and there didn't need to be. You could say there's insight in Kim Jong-il's no-show, that his people love and revere him, but he's not always available to receive them. 
or that it's a love reciprocated, but it's just enough to observe and listen to a group of people in a very closed and restricted country. Consider it our privilege. I'm the Asian film fanatic, and I'll see you later.